Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming back for another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi. Um, I've got Richard Cohen and Carol Garboden Murray with me again today to keep the conversation going about uh, Kara's pedagogy and uh, Carol's book, upcoming book, Illuminating Care. Right? Yes. <laughs> I was like, wait, maybe it's just Kara's pedagogy, but um, so uh, I am ex so excited that you both still want to talk to me about this kind of stuff. And um, uh, uh, so I guess we'll just jump in. I confessed to both of them before we started recording that I wasn't feeling my sharpest and I hoped they had things to say. And now it's become apparent for everyone <laughs> that I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, here's our quote. And this is in your book, Carol. This is, this is coming from a chapter about self-care. And it's Nell Noddings, who thank you so much for introducing me to Nell Noddings. I'd never yeah. heard of her either, so I had to do lots of searching and reading. Um, but Nell says, if caring is to be maintained, clearly the one caring must be maintained. She must be strong, courageous, and capable of joy. And I, 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 I love that whole, just that strong courageous and capable of joy that that really hit me and spoke to me yes, um, yes. so thank you for including this quote and so, so why carol i'll let you start why did you feel like in a book about caring for children you also needed to talk about caring for ourselves well that to me was sort of the starting place and for me on my journey trying to analyze care but it was the last thing I put in the book because it's the hardest thing to understand and it's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to practice is self care. Um, so I've really struggled, you know, I've really struggled writing this chapter and I, and I just have said, I want to be a companion with all of you who have caring in the central center of your life. If you are working in a caring profession, like we all are when we work with young children, I want to analyze this with you. Why is it so hard to care for ourselves? Because I certainly am an expert in the struggle <laughs> to care. And um, I know that there has to be a better way to do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I kind of start by talking about like this whole notion of, you know, getting a massage or eating chocolate or going for a long walk. It's all wonderful because we need to have balanced lives and we need to have joy in our lives and we need to take care of our physical selves. Um, but sometimes that feels like an escape. How can we integrate self-care into our daily work mm. so that we really model a healthy way of caring for others? That's the question mm. I'm asking. Yeah, and I think you're, you're definitely right. Our, our first, most of us, for, when we think about self-care, we're thinking about those special events and um, treating ourselves to, you know, for me, it's a a bath and a glass of wine and a good book. And that's, that's what I'll do for myself. But, um, but I'm very um, neglectful of the daily stuff. Like, um, so, so it was interesting that, that you just put that right out there for everybody, that there's a, a deeper way of looking at it. The other way is okay. Um, and certainly meets some needs, but there's a deeper way and a more daily way of, of processing this idea. Yeah. If I can jump in for just a second, I'd like the the nerds, um, listeners and viewers to know that she was totally lying just now. Uh, it is not uh, a glass of wine and chocolate. It's Doritos and a more than a, a quart of ice cream. <laughs> in her Facebook posts, you know she's a lying liar who lies. So listen... Um... I had to, I had to start thinking deeply about how many uh, photos from the tub that I was putting on Facebook. So that's happening. Well, so imagine how, now that I, I'm holding back and you're, the number that you're seeing is still Thank out you. there. So on behalf of everybody. <laughs> you too. So yeah, I'm going to suddenly get a bunch of new Facebook requests now. Mention that, but I'm not opposed to the quart of ice cream or no. the bag of Doritos either. But no, uh, definitely not. Yeah, I was hoping to keep that part a little more. <laughs> can I? Can I go? Thank you, dear. Can I go back though with Carol though? Please. Um, I would love to get into Carol what you what you believe to be more effective or, or self care that's happening while we're with kids. But can we first start with the earlier piece you said, which is because that's what I found to be true as well in my 
four decades in this field, is that we attract the type, we tend to attract the type of human being who's not very good at self-care. Right. And I wonder if you could speak to why you think, or what you found out about why that might be. Yeah, so I think those of us who are attracted to the caring profession, we do enter it because we, we get so much joy, right, from seeing another person grow, from supporting another. And I do think it's a part of being human. I think every human gets joy from that. I think that rather than asking this question, you know, how do we develop empathy? How do we become more caring? The question is really, how do we lose those things? You know, how we, we, we come into the world with care and there's those of us who are just so fascinated with this first stage of life and we, we are um, in awe. And so it's a, it's a wonderful sort of rewarding work. We feel the reward. We want to make a difference. We want to support other people. And whether it's because of our own internal beliefs about care or because of the way society views care, um, somehow we fall into this pattern of practicing care like sacrifice. And I think of care, the kind of these characteristics of care having polar opposites, like care is joy, but on the other hand, care is a burden, care is a sacrifice. Care is altruistic, it's putting others before yourself. On the other hand, care is neglecting the self. Care is not having any needs. Care is advocating and using a voice to speak for protection of others. On the other hand, care is having no voice. Care is, uh, you know, suppressing your own needs. Um, care is silent. So there's these, these polar opposites in the way that we treat care and the way society treats care. And I, in analyzing care, you know, thought true, healthy, balanced care is a partnership. It's giving and receiving. It's really not meant to be a sacrifice. That's not a healthy way to care for people. So how can we be, develop an awareness about our own beliefs about care and try to, I think awareness is the first thing, right? Try to understand when we're slipping up and down that scale between care being a burden and care being joy. And when we feel that care is a burden, which we all will feel it is a burden because anything you do 40 hours a week, anything where you get a paycheck every two weeks and you're depending upon this job and this culture that we work in is, even if it's your joy, even if it is your vocation and you love this work, there are definitely a lot of days when it doesn't feel joyful, right? So how do we develop a, an awareness like, wow, this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel joyful. I'm kind of getting in a rut here. Um, how do we develop that awareness so that we can find a center? We can kind of return to a center and figure out kind of how to care for ourselves as we go about the work. Knowing that when we care about ourselves, when we go more slowly, when we breathe, when we practice presence with the children, that it's going to benefit everyone. Yeah, very well yep. said. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it's true. It's complicated stuff, right? Yeah. So well, I, think I think I'd like to add like a, a contextual footnote. This came up in our, for anyone who's watching this, by the way, make, or listening to this, make sure you go back and, this is part two, so make sure you go back and listen to mine and Carol and Heather's, Heather's first uh, conversation about this topic, because it lays the foundation for what we're talking about now. And I hesitate to be repetitive, but... I want to just throw it out there because I'm always, I hear Carol talking about content and I'm very, uh, one of my like missions in life is to always help people understand and notice context because uh, we forget about that. Mm -hmm. So um, I was introduced to Nell Nodding's work back in the late 80s when I went to Pacific Oaks mm -hmm. uh, or maybe early 90s. So mm -hmm. feminist perspective on caring. Yes. And so... When you were listing the, uh, Carol, when you were listing the two sides of the caring coin just now and all of those various examples, I sat here thinking, wow, I can't really relate to the negative sides, like mm. being silent. Mm. And isn't that because I was enculturated uh, as a male in our society? As I listen to your list of sort of the negative sides, I feel like they're all messages that primarily women receive uh, and girls receive, but men don't. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the undergirding of this, of this topic we're on. And I just want to make sure that people are pondering that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I think that's a really good point. And I think that the work that, that Nell Nodding did was right there with Carol Gilligan, who wrote, you know, in a, in a different voice. And when they both started talking about care, um, there was a lot of criticism about this sort of feminist approach. And, and they both were very clear about saying, this is a human approach. When we include the voice of women who have been the caretakers, who have been making decisions in relationships, who have been silent, when we include the voice of women, we change the conversation, we change the dialogue for men and women. And Carol Gilligan told this really incredible story about how she was trying to have conversations with people about Vietnam and other issues that were happening when she was, you know, back at Harvard, I think, working alongside Piaget and, you know, just some of the, some of the psychologists that we know well, Kohlberg. And um, she said that once she was able to get the women to speak about their experience, that the men started speaking differently, too. Because when you exist in a world where there is an acceptable way to talk about things, that is the, the ground that is set. This is how we have this conversation. But once you bring in voices of people who have typically been silent or things that haven't been talked about much, then the, then the, the perspective changes and you realize that these are issues that are human issues. These are not women's issues or men's issues. They're not gendered issues. They're human issues. Um, but, but we have to be able to practice this sort of radical listening and, <laughs> and include the voices of everyone. Yeah, the voices have to be there for yes. anyone to experience that. And that's, I think, where it gets, um, gets tricky and requires more intention that we have yeah. to make sure those voices are there. Mm -hmm. Because we were all raised in a society in which power is not equitably distributed. And so once you realize that, and then you start to figure out who has less, and, and then you start to, then for me as a male, I start to stand back and go, oh, I've got, a, I think the technical term is, term is a, a crap ton of power <laughs> um, yes. in this world, just because of the body I was born into. Oh, I need to shut up, which I'm not doing right now, and listen <laughs> to um, someone else's perspective on this, who uh, I can't understand unless I stop and listen, because mm -hmm. it's not available to me otherwise. We were all born into this world where that disequity of power exists. And most of us, it's like water for fish. We don't even notice it's there. Right. That's right. We consciously look for it. Right. Yeah. But, and I thought, go ahead. I was just saying, which is also why it's difficult to be open to that conversation because we think, well, I haven't done anything intentionally to block out other voices um, because it is like water around a fish. It's just there. And we don't realize the, um, the actions that contribute to it until we become open to thinking, okay, so I don't feel that this is my real experience, but I want to hear your real experience. And then it maybe sort of opens things up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with care, it's been, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit the last time we've been told not to really talk about care. We've been told to talk about academic, you know, standards. Yeah. So I feel that talking about care is in many ways a revolutionary act because we are trying to change the conversation. We mm -hmm. are saying that we can talk about care for the sake of care that care is this, the physical acts of caring for children is an intellectual encounter mm -hmm. with the other. And if I keep talking about, you know, scientific uh, reasoning and mathematical sequencing every time I talk about how children learn, yeah. I'm using someone else's language. I want to use the language from within, the language that I understand. I want to speak authentically about what I see happening between humans in the caring exchange. And so it isn't always heard because mm -hmm. it, the pedagogy of care is really a new language. It isn't yeah. always understood. It isn't always heard. Um, it's sometimes dismissed. So I think just that developing that awareness that that care is enough. So we've been told it's not enough. So we've, we've kind of gotten defensive, like, okay, I am a teacher. I am teaching children a lot of important things. I, I can talk about math. I can talk about science. I can talk about all this, but that's okay. We've had to, we've needed to be in this defensive spot, right? We've had to be there to be heard. And now I'm hoping that in this transition that we're making, hopefully as a society, I'm hoping, I know it's messy and I know it takes a long time, but I'm hoping that we can talk more honestly about 
the beginning of life yeah. and the human exchange and care as yeah. pedagogy. Yeah, I've been thinking um, the last week or so a lot about Maslow, and it's become very trendy lately, um, you know, the last year, but especially during the pandemic, to talk about uh, Maslow before Bloom. And, um, and I agree with that, but it's funny to me that the same field that is really projecting that as um, something, you know, that they're proud of is also insulted by being called just childcare <laughs> because Maslow is care. And then Bloom is, you know, can't, can't really happen until all that care has been going on. And then that sort of led me to, well, this is true for the adults working with young children too. We have to do the Maslow stuff before we can try to be the Bloom stuff for yeah. the children that we're working with. So it's, it's, I don't know. It's funny to me that um, that we've embraced this little catchphrase, but it hasn't doesn't seem to really have registered into our direct work. Um, yeah, that we have to we have to give intentional, thoughtful, authentic attention to care with the children, with ourselves, if we hope to get to the other stuff that we um, you know are so proud to think we've achieved. Yeah, I think that self-awareness is so hard. And I, I kind of start by talking about that. And it was hard for me to write about it because, you know, there's this, you don't want to be negative. You don't want to put all this garbage out there. Like I'm thinking as a director of a program, you know, once you start complaining at a staff meeting, it's like, <laughs> oh gosh, here we're having a, you know, a gripe session and it doesn't feel like it's really supporting the direction we need to go as a school. But I would hear so often teachers saying negative things about care, you know, treating care like drudgery. You know, what do these parents think we are? We're just babysitters. And, you know, I really was planning to be a kindergarten teacher because I think these two and three year olds shouldn't be in school. And, you know, if, yeah. if parents, you know, maybe parents should figure out a way to, to you know, use their credit cards or, or, or something so they don't have to, you know, go to work and put their kids in here with us. They're, yeah. And these are people who care about children and these are people who do really good work. But I kept feeling that there was this um, underlying attitude within the profession mm -hmm. that they resented care. Right. right. And sometimes the way parents would treat us was as parents resented care as well. Oh. They resented having to work and having to leave their kids with us. And sometimes there's this feeling of, of do I really trust you? How do you, how can you do this? Or sometimes you give parents advice and they're like, you know, this is, there's just this weird resentment around care that props up. And it's hard to talk about that stuff, but I think trying to develop an awareness of how do I really feel about care, about the work that I have to do, which is a physical sort of custodial ritual of care. Can I find a way to understand this as a human value, as an essential um, intellectual whole body experience that is going to grow healthy humans and grow myself as I enter this care partnership? Can I have new ways of viewing care so that, that I can, I don't have to suppress this subconscious. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm making any sense right now, but uh, it's hard stuff to talk about. It's, it's deep work because we have to look at those shadows um, in order to confront them and in order to move into healthy ways of seeing ourselves in our work. It's one thing to say, no one respects me. No one respects caregivers. No one respects this work. But it's another thing to find those feelings within ourselves, to feel crummy about ourselves when we're stuck, you know, changing a soiled child or, mm -hmm. or um, after we've just, you know, helped 10 toddlers get out of their <laughs> wet socks and you know there's some of this work is very tangible physical stuff yeah it is important stuff yeah how do we how do we name it how do we examine our own attitudes towards it well and and again i hate to sound like a broken record but to me one of the reasons why it's so hard to have this conversation for some people is because the stream, the, the river we're swimming in is patriarchal. And to have this conversation is to swim against the tide. That's right. Um, and we're not, most human beings aren't enculturated to do that. It's too uncomfortable. 
-hmm. You know, I was sitting here thinking in just this last part as you were speaking, Carol, I, I had, I had my, in my, my last position was as a director of a uh, child, I don't even think we called it a child care center. <laughs> they, before I arrived, they chose to name it a child development center because mm -hmm. care had a certain connotation to it, <clears throat> they want, right? Mm -hmm. And they could, they thought the board, perhaps, that they could charge more if it was called a child development center. And get right. greater consideration for grants and other funding sources. Yes. <laughs> and I inherited a budget. And of course, one of the first things I noticed is that, I mean, one thing that I was pleased to see in the budget was that every classroom had their classroom budget to pull from and they had the autonomy to nice. choose the materials. But it was very clear that the preschool teachers had higher budgets than the toddler teachers who had slightly higher budgets than the infant teachers who got bupkis. God. <laughs> and to me, that's like a tangible example of what I'm hearing you speak about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really teachers. The older the child we teach, we're really teachers. If we're teaching college kids or high school kids, wow, we really are teachers. And then <laughs> as we go down, as we go down to the younger ones, it's, it's more and more questionable about our status and our role. Um, yeah, so our value. Our value. So we have to have a great deal of self-care and self-respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a huge, um, like you said, swimming against the tide. It's a huge revolutionary act. It's, a, it's an advocacy act just to care with respect and dignity. It doesn't have to be going to the state capitol and carrying a sign and changing legislation, but just day by day to know that you, the work you're doing is important and you're doing it with dignity and you're doing it with well, very well, as, as, as excellently as you can. Um, I think that's an act of advocacy. I know that that seems like a baby step and a, and a slow road, but it, it, we just have to believe that it starts within, right? Um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to work for better salary and status and all the right. things we need to, um, to lift up the care work, but there is, there is some important internal work that we need to do in understanding our, our own attitudes towards care and, and thinking about how the, the way we treat care and talk about care in the, in the profession. Okay. Because then that ripples out to our colleagues in that direct care with us. If we are seen and heard to be valuing those parts of the day, um, that, I mean, that, that can influence the ones who are the other adults who are in the room or the center or the home with us, um, which I think is going to probably have more impact on the real world, the real um, work that's being done with children than the advocacy at the state house. Mm -hmm. Advocacy at the state house has its place. It's intimidating for most people who are doing the work to think, well, I don't know how to do that, but you do know how to provide good intentional care and how to talk to your coworker about what you're doing and why. Um, so you're, you're still playing a strong role in the capital A advocacy um, that we know that we need to do. Yeah. yeah. And also in the, in the relationships we have with one another and with families too, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yep. valuing, uh, the work of mothers and fathers, um, including them as, I know there was a point where some of my teachers were saying, you know, the, the parents aren't really asking so much. We're doing this beautiful, you know, play-based, you know, art-inspired curriculum and, mm -hmm. and documenting our work. And the parents aren't really asking much about this. They seem to be okay with that. They're asking us about like bedtime and bath time and oh. brushing teeth and yes. <laughs> that's not really our job, is it? <laughs> like, well, actually, you know, we need to be experts in yeah. care as well. We need, and parents are looking to you as a resource. That's really, that's really elevates your status. Yep. If you can return to them this, this message that those are the important moments of the day that, that build your relationship with your child and build his and her confidence in their own agency as learners. Um, and if you can, if we can think about how we become experts in those incredible milestones children moving from underwear you know from diapers to underwear from from breasts to bottle to forks and spoons mm -hmm. these are huge milestones in the life of a zero to five year old and and uh, if we can begin to talk about those 
those physical acts of growth as um, as part of our a pedagogy. How do how do we support children in healthy ways, and how do we support families to understand this dynamic change that's happening as kids move away from babyhood? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a lot, and we don't really have a, a we have an incredible body of expertise to yes. rely on, but within our field, we don't always think about that as part of our curriculum. Right. It, well, I don't think that it gets delineated down to the folks doing the direct care as much as it could be. I think, you know, because most programs, whatever their setting is, providing care for young children, um, have very limited budgets. They can't spend a lot on professional development. And we know that just going to a workshop is not probably enough to change practice. They also might need some in-person coaching and mentoring and ongoing opportunities. And that's expensive. <laughs> so, so it's hard to get that, that body of research that we have and that expertise down to the people who are really, um, I don't mean down to, but in with <laughs> the people who need, who need to hear it. Um, so it, it becomes very uneven um, in terms of delivery because not everybody has the access they need. Uh, and every, when you study, you know, care, you realize again, how layered it is. I mean, one of the most complicated conferences I've ever spoken at uh, was, a, it was just a workshop about family style meals. And it was just a hard one to teach and, with this particular group because there were so many beliefs among the participants about the things I was saying mm -hmm. about not pre-plating children's food and not making them eat their peas before they have more chicken and yes. that kind of thing. And so it, then it, it reveals, wow, to understand care and to think about best practices for children, you know, we have to really unpack our own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a lot of, a lot of strong beliefs around food and meals and that's mm -hmm. such a cultural issue. It's so, so laden with our, with our feeling that if I don't teach a kid to eat his peas before he has his carrots, I'm not a good caregiver. I'm not right. a good parent. Yeah. So oh, that it, it gets really complicated. And if, if you are directing a center and you are saying, okay, we are going to do family style meals and we're going to really rely on research that tells us sort of how it is best to help children develop a relationship with food, not yeah. to bribe them, not to praise them, not to scold them around meals. You know, there are some really basic practices that we have a lot of support and a lot yeah. of nutritionists and counselors and experts yeah. telling us this is an essential relationship children are developing with food right. between ages of two and five. Now, if we look at those practices, we can also say, how can this, how can this help you care for yourself as, a, as an adult? You know, not only can you examine your own attitudes around food, but maybe at mealtime you can sit with children. Maybe at mealtime you can have meals with them. Maybe you can have a cup of tea with them. Maybe you can take care of yourself. Maybe you can pull yeah. over a comfortable chair and have a conversation with children. This is what children need and it's also what you need. You need to slow down. I don't want you as a director to have to be running into the back to get your lesson plan ready and to cut out 102 you know, <laughs> little legs to put the spiders together for the craft that you have yeah, planned. Yeah. I, want the, I want this meal time to be an essential part of your pedagogy and a break for you and the children. Yeah. You know? I have so many stories about food related conversations with parents and staff, but I'll save it for when we're talking about the, those daily routines when we do our next episode. Um, but it's it's definitely a tricky, emotional, heavy process with a yeah. lot of folks. Yeah. And it's so funny to me. Um, I know I just said I wasn't going to tell any stories, but it just this, okay. like the same, so often in my experience, the same teachers who are forcing kids to clean their plates or to eat the peas before they have more milk or whatever it is, are the ones who won't eat with the children because they don't like the food. <laughs> Oh my, yeah, it's deep. Um, it is so deep. It's just interesting. Yeah. Okay, sorry, but no, that's great. That's a great <laughs> example. It's so well, deep. I think that one of the things. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Carol. Go ahead. No. Okay. No, please. Okay. Well, you I have think our one of the things again undergirding this conversation that we're talking about is power and control. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I know a lot of lovely, lovely human beings who are early educators who will say that. The reason they make the children eat the peas first and the reason why they portion out the food and all those things 
they control the children's experience um, is because they care. Yeah, you know, yeah, I love definitely. the kids like there, so I need to make sure that they get these needs, these nutritional needs met, right. or that they've learned all 26 letters by the time they're done with me. That with they've learned to behave that. appropriately. Right. <laughs> and one of the things that I've found because about I care. early childhood education is it's a leap of faith. Um, you have to take that leap of letting children control their experience. Um, but most of us are our brains are miswired around um, how our care gets expressed because we think that the best way to care is to control the children's experience. And you find out if you take that leap of faith and, and really follow the children's lead mm -hmm. through your sense of care, that they thrive in ways you never could have imagined. Mm -hmm. That's such a good example of really analyzing care. And that's what I hope the book will do. Like, if you think that care is about fixing someone or controlling someone, please let's look at what care really is. Care mm -hmm. is a partnership, especially around these relationships of body, food, toileting, sleeping. We cannot control children and they know it. They right. know we, we cannot control them. There, is, there are some behavioral techniques. There is something that is more in the realm of forcing yeah, yeah. Um, that, that is not going to help the child develop in the, the healthiest way. Um, but, but again, examining care. Care is not about fixing. Care is not about imposing your direction upon the other. Mm -hmm. Care is about supporting encouraging, providing uh, a, a relationship, a partnership. If I'm the adult, I'm going to make sure you have lots of ch healthy choices, but I'm not going to tell you the order in which yeah. to eat your food or how much you have to eat. I don't know when you're full. I don't know when you're hungry. I respect your likes and your dislikes. I realize that's all a part of your <laughs> identity and your particular stage of development, you know, so there's so much we can learn about the science of how children develop relationships with food and about care, what mm -hmm. care is and what care is not. Are we, do we tend to be over carers? Do we tend to force our, impose ourselves upon others? Maybe we do. Yeah, I could say on many situations, I'm, I over care. You know, I run up and make my son's bed for him when really I, he's a teenager and I should not be doing that. Why do I have this need to overcare, to fix, to take, to impose myself, to entangle myself? So having that sort of awareness and, and analyzing yourself and, and being able to pull back and to observe and to respect and to find the boundary yeah. between me and the other person, that's really hard. It's quite an art and a science. Yeah. So this is again showing us the complicated nature of, of working with this idea that care is a pedagogy and a practice yeah. that we can grow in. And to bring it back to, to self-care and there being deeper levels, some of us have some healing that we need to do for ourselves so that we can um, so that we can look at what we how we care for children through a new lens. Um, uh, I know, and Lisa Murphy likes to say um, that our field attracts broken people and caring for others is part of how we try to heal from that. But there's actually deeper work we need to do often. I know for myself that has been true. Um, you know, I essentially came into the field because I had a mother wound and I thought that caring for other children would be um, a good way for me to sort of hide from that when in fact it highlighted it and made me see that I needed to do some, some healing for myself. But I, I think that's a big part of it is if we feel this need to be in power over or in control of everything, why is that? And is it, is it something that we need to look at in ourselves so that we can do better for children? And, and knowing that that is a way of caring for yourself, yeah. doing that with reflective work is yeah. a way of healing and caring for yourself and taking the pressure off. That's a lot of pressure to fix someone and change someone. Yeah. Education isn't about fixing and changing and neither is care. It's about yeah. growing and, and having respect for that person's internal direction. They, they are in control of the direction, you, not you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true that, you know, we, we enter the caring profession because we have wounds to heal. But sometimes I wonder just in, general if it's if it's just all of society everybody has wounds every, to heal I, and we i just wonder if every terms, profession yeah. i really wonder if every yeah. profession could say wow you know yeah, humans humans are all like 
you know, we all come from dysfunctional families. Yeah. Yeah. We all have our stories. We all have our healing. I don't know um, if this is a particularly uh, broken time in in the world where we're examining that. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe so. Our eyes are being opened more to it. Um, yeah. So much as this, it is. It is quite a quite a moment in history. <laughs> Perhaps you not. Be, um, a very skilled lawyer or accountant. Um, and not have to deal with the abuse you suffered when you were a child. Um, so I think you're right. I agree. It's, it's the human condition. But it's particularly critical for us because our job description is caring for other people's young children in their most critical foundational years of life. Yeah. So I feel like, yes, it's true for everyone, but it's more important in some ways for the people in our profession to do that hard personal work in order to be effective professionals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's hard for a lot of people. You know, yeah. as I think about, I was sitting here thinking about where I got my beliefs about care. I like to think I'm a caring person. Where did that, and I'm 55, where did that come from? Well, you know, it came from my mom and my dad and my primary attachments when I was very little. Um, My mom passed away in 2016. And it's only been in the last year that I've really come to understand that she was fallible and imperfect (laughs) and really start to, and it's been painful, but really start to deal with these ideas of some of the ways that uh, I behave in the world that don't serve myself or my marriage, for example, um, are rooted in some of the fallibilities of my parents, which were rooted in the fallibilities of their parents. And so to really understand this care piece, you have to do some hard personal work. It's true. And and, and I I just tell myself all the time that care is not perfect. You know, that this is a messy field. Mm -hmm. We have to be kind to ourselves as we're, we're being kind to children. Um, that it, that, it, that it is not perfect. And, and even when you're practicing becoming more aware, you develop, you, it's, it's hard. Like I, I have been working a lot on boundaries. And so when I practice boundaries, I don't do it so well, you know, <laughs> the first few times. And I, I, on the way home, I'm like, oh, I could have said that differently. I could have said that better. You know, I want to be confident and kind and, and at the same time, but sometimes I'm too aggressive or sometimes I'm too passive. You know, when you start to you become awareness, it, you become aware, I need, I need more boundaries around certain things um, to really care for myself and care for others. And, and it's come up a lot with the pandemic. I've realized, wow, boundaries are a really important part of caring with strength. And um, it's not hard. It's not easy to change it. It's not easy to change yourself, to grow yourself in this caring work. And it isn't perfect. It isn't perfect. You have to revisit it and, mm-hmm. and, and keep practicing and believe in your own growth as well as the growth of the, of the kids and the colleagues that you are a part of these cultures of caring with. <laughs> And, and I would suggest again that this piece specifically around boundaries uh, is, prob- is probably more prevalent for females than for males. Yes. Right? Um, I wasn't raised to have boundaries. I was raised to sit on the bus and spread my legs as far apart as possible. <laughs> take up as much of that seat as I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one told me to put my legs together and, and, and be aware of other people's needs around me uh-huh. and let them have space. I wasn't, I wasn't enculturated that, but I think most women were. Mm -hmm. So the boundary piece, I think for a lot of people, but specifically for a lot of women Mm -hmm. is a real growing edge. Yes. Uh, And and it's hard because it feels like I'm not being nice. And somehow, I think the other thing about care is people equate it with niceness. And uh, that's, care is so much more complex than just Mm -hmm. niceness. And I think Nell, Nell Nodding said at the beginning that we have to be courageous and we have to be strong yes. in order to, to care for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And you have to value yourself. That's I right. Think we have a lot of people in our field that are disempowered and don't value themselves. If you're going to take the time for self-care, or rather, you're not going to take the time for self-care if you don't think you're worth caring for. Yeah. That's right. And the work that you're doing is, is, is part of your self-worth. Mm-hmm. So if you're yeah. changing diapers and, and washing hands all day, 
how do you value that work? How do you value yourself within that work? How does your institution and your organization show that that is essential, central, important work that we're going to give time and attention to? Well, We've reached okay, the part of the podcast I, where Richard and I just nod while Carol talks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think back on my, on my last job as a director and, you know, again, we, I like, I also try to always look at things from a systemic or an institutionalized point of view. So those budgets, the, the consumables budgets that were higher for preschool teachers than infant teachers, the professional development budget was higher for preschool teachers than infant teachers. Mm -hmm. And there was a culture in which, and it's not a surprise, there was a culture in which uh, the preschool teachers felt more respected uh, and the infant caregivers, even there, just the distinction between calling them infant caregivers and infant teachers, even though I have more respect for the term caregiver, <laughs> it speaks more deeply to uh -huh. our role. That's not the greater society. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, it permeated the center that I entered was yeah. the, these are lesser than people. Mm -hmm. And I had a, uh, I inherited a, a teachers and uh, it, when the new school year hit, two of them were to be teamed together in the preschool um, wing of the school. It was a large school and they, they were not compatible. Uh, and it would not have been a good idea to, to pair them up as a team. And so I said to the one teacher, well, uh, I do have an opening in my uh, older mobile infants room, if you'd like to try that out. And the, first of all, that, that took a while for her to make peace with because yeah. it felt like a downgrade. Right. Right. Um, but also once she was in there, she would come to my office and cry, which is fine. I don't have any judgments around crying. Mm -hmm. and I'm, <laughs> I'm all about the, I'm all about it. Uh -huh. um, so I'm a safe place, you know, and she would say, I, I've got this master's degree and all I do is change diapers all day. Yeah. You know, and I just don't feel like, well, what did I do? I'm still paying off my student loans for what? To change diapers? Well, yeah, let me remind you and let's look at the research that there's nothing more important than that moment you spend however many times a day changing diapers. It's way more um, it will shape that little person way more than the five minutes that the preschool teacher makes slime and Play-Doh with her kids. That's right. Um, be proud of that. That's mm -hmm. an amazing thing. I know it's exhausting and I know it's stinky. But, um, <laughs> it's so important yes. what you do. And she finally came to me about six or nine months later and went, oh, I get it now. Oh, I good. see now Hooray. the difference I'm making. And I'm loving being an infant teacher. Yeah. But that took a lot of work to get her there because she had to break down a whole lot of beliefs she had going into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for myself, I, I that's such a great story, and and I just it reminded me of a couple of situations I've had where I I found myself with the master's degree and I kept trying to work with younger, 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 younger children, and and I I was like, why do I keep wanting to go to these babies and toddlers? <laughs> and I think it was because I. I did know enough about myself to know that it was about that human development, that family relationship, that care, that, that kind of seed of potential that, mm -hmm. that we see with those really tiny ones that are just learning to move and their first words are forming. I, I was always so fascinated with that, which I think led me to that study of care. Mm -hmm. but, it's so, it, but I also often felt that, that I was viewed as, as taking demotions, like you said, moving closer and closer to the baby and the toddler. Um, and I remember one school that I, I took a job at, um, it was a small school and they didn't have much of a budget. And, they, and, and I remember the director who was a very wise woman said, I really want you to work with the toddlers. I want you to be, this is our youngest group. It's an 18 month old you know, starting point that they didn't have babies there. And she said, I want that person who meets the families to be able to demonstrate the highest quality education. This is their, the, the family's first impression of us and this is the relationship that we want to keep with these kids for the next three years so i need you to be at the beginning and i thought oh, <laughs> that 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 was such a good you know match yeah, for me. Yes. yeah. It was such a rare a rare message right because i think that quite often and we're getting up on close to an hour so we're gonna have to find a stopping point yeah. at some place at some point but um so often in uh centers i've been part of 
people that I've talked to, um, the the teachers, the 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 employees who are seen with um, sort of lower skills or that we're not quite sure about, we put with infants because we think that that right. doesn't require that kind of expertise and um, that I just that's so backwards. And I know you both know that, but it's 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 been in my mind again, as I'm teaching an intro to early childhood education course for the next eight weeks, I, I did a, a lecture about different types, types of settings. And I put infant care and toddler care as specific settings, even though that care happens in the other settings that I was talking about, because I want people to know that this is something you can intentionally choose. <laughs> And that the the care that's valuable there, then the flip side is that the care that's valuable with that age group is also in, valuable with the older age group. So, um, so that hopefully these people who are just coming into the field will come in with a little bit of a different perspective than I have experienced myself most yeah. often. And uh, it's been really interesting to have those conversations with them. That's great. I tend to see the grandmas put in the infant. Room. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Travel around, right? Right. Um, be, and they and they have less formal education. Right. Yep. Um, and and again, th this always just takes me, you know, I, back to patriarchy, which is there's a difference between education and wisdom, mm -hmm. and we're in a society that tends to place value on education, on formal right. education, right, and downplay the value of wisdom, which so many of those uh, older women who have lived longer, fuller lives have, mm -hmm. but wisdom isn't valued as much as a degree. Absolutely. And so we put them with the babies. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I ask people in my book to sort of evaluate their own wisdom, their own, there's a lot of ancient inherited care practices that are beautiful, yes. that we want to hold on to, that we sometimes, I'm now also with you, Richard, in my 50s, we don't see the young teachers bouncing babies on their knees or singing the lullabies. Yeah, so we want, they don't even know the nursery rhymes no. and lullabies because they haven't experienced it themselves. Yeah. And those things are so nurturing in, in terms of self-care, right? Yeah. If you yeah. can pull up those ancient caring rituals that have been passed on for generation to generation, um, and also with that, holding on to these things that you've learned from your family, also evaluate the other stuff. You know, if your mom told you you had to clean everything on your plate, evaluate that too. There might be some stuff we have to let go of and there might be yeah. some stuff that we really want to hold close. Yeah. And if we can hold those things close to us and say, I am a caregiver because I learned this song from my mom, my grandma. I learned, I, I have a wisdom in my body. I know how to hold babies. I love, you know, I love, um, you know, singing this song when I push mm -hmm. them in the swing, whatever, those, there's some beautiful care rituals that we can, we can elevate mm -hmm. and we can see research is telling us these, these are educational, you know, this right. is why children have great vocabularies because of the lullabies. This is why they have strong core because of the bouncing on the knee, rough and tumble right. play that you learn from your uncle or whatever. So <laughs> we can, we can validate them with research and we can yeah. hold on to those things and we can, we can find our own personal joy as we care, yeah. but also to have this self-reflective vein where we're letting go of things that might not be serving children, um, things that we inherited that uh, could be reevaluated. Mm -hmm. It's, it is really hard work. And, <laughs> and I hope that just, I just invite everyone to analyze care, really, really think about what care is. And that's what this, this book does. It, there's seven lamps of care and it asks you to, to look at care with these principles in mind and use them to guide you. There's no, it's not a how-to guide, right? We, mm -hmm. care is messy human individual work. It's not a how-to kind of thing. It's, it's about being a practitioner that is reflective and uh, and thoughtful and growing along with the children. Yeah. And I would just say, don't just analyze it, right? Because when I hear analyze, I hear cognition and your head. That's but right. If you're really going to um, take on the topic of care, you have to use this part too. You have to use your bring your body into it and trust your what your intuition is telling you about this subject analyze Absolutely. it, but also um, see what your body has to say about it. Yep. That's so yep. true. Yes. Yep. Because often- sure, Can I ask her one last question? Oh, sure, go. Really quick. Uh-huh. Super quick. No, I okay. swear. Okay, go. 
Carol, when does your book come out and where can we get it? <laughs> it will be out, I'm hoping in, in January. We just, we're in the final edits and it's Exchange Press. You can visit me on Facebook, Illuminating Care, The Pedagogy and Practice of Care. Carol Garboden Murray, I have a website. So it's coming and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, release little bits and pieces of it on the website and, and uh, on Facebook. And it's, it's exciting. Thank you so much for joining me in this journey of getting it out into the world. I'm I'm just glad that uh, that we've been able to have all of these conversations, um, and I think once the book's out, we'll just continue having um, great conversations about it. I'm excited. I've been talking about uh, talking about it in terms of the revolution that's coming. <laughs> yay! Yay! We are the pioneers. We are, yeah. So thank you so much for your work, Carol, and uh, for being here, and Richard for being here. I'm mm-hmm. going to wrap up before any of us have any more thoughts. <laughs> and thanks everybody for listening. Come back again next week for another episode. Bye. Bye. Uh-huh.